When Carolyn walked into the orientation session, she inwardly rolled her eyes and let out a sigh. Here we go again, she thought, as she looked out at the veritable sea of well-meaning whiteness. She was attending the orientation to learn more about an organization that described itself as committed to social justice. While the organization was overwhelmingly white, they were working hard to educate themselves on various forms of oppression. This wasn't the first time she was the only black person in the room, but Carolyn reasoned that at least these white people were committed to social progressives. But at least these white people were committed social progressives. She joined and started attending a weekly subgroup where she was, yet again, the only person of color in the room. I definitely can relate. Uh, as an educator, I usually am the only person of color. Uh, predominantly, education is filled with white women. At the end of the sixth week, the facilitator, a white male, informed her that the next week they would be studying racism and asked her if she would teach that session. She told him she needed to think about it. And then she called me in a state of distress. Carolyn and I have been friends and colleagues for over 20 years. We met when we were both hired as facilitators of a mandated equity training for a government organization. Since that time, we have co-led countless anti-racism sessions and been through many of our own personal challenges navigating a long-term interracial friendship. Her mentorship has had a profound impact on my understanding of systemic racism. When Carolyn called me that day, she was torn. On the one hand, she wanted to give this information, give them this information because they desperately needed it. On the other hand, to be the only black person in the group and have to explain how racism manifested both in the general and in the group itself was terrifying. She risked being subjected to the patterns of white fragility that are all too common when white people are challenged on race. So here's some of those things, these patterns that we find. Uh, minimalization, defensiveness, anger, invalidation, hurt feelings and guilt. The worst, you guys, is when we get to the white tears because uh, they pretend that they are hurt. Well, I don't know if they're pretending that they're hurt, but they have hurt feelings when traditionally it's been the black people that have suffered. I, I can't grok it. I can't understand that, but it happens. Would she be seen as an aggressor as they position themselves as victimized? Mm -hmm. Would she lose valued relationships? Well, if she did, I, I say, hey, we don't need you, okay? Would this be her last session in the group? She, she decided that she would share her experience as a black person if I came with her and also spoke to them specifically as a white person about white patterns of racism. She well understood that white people are generally more receptive to hearing about racism from other white people. My presence would also ensure that she had a trusted ally at her side to support her. I agree. Yes, I love allies. Allies are the best. I'm just gonna circle this because I'm looking for trusted allies in my life. As the days passed and she prepared her presentation, she called me many times to vent her fear and anxiety. The request to teach an all-white group about racism took a long, tremendous toll on Carolyn. In addition to the emotional work she was doing, she spent hours preparing her presentation, trying to make it indispensable so she would not be negated. Being in front of an all-white group also triggered in her a lifetime of racist abuse from white teachers, schools, and society at large. Oof, I know the feeling. 
she was up against the relentless messages that as a black woman she was unintelligent and had no knowledge of intrinsic value uh, so some of the things that I've been told or one of the things I should say that I've been told is I'm pretty smart for a black woman so I definitely get uh, that she has had these messages all her life. Finally, the evening came. The group listened thoughtfully to both of us and then asked questions or made comments. Toward the end of the evening, a member of the group stated in a tone somewhat critical of the organization, I am so glad this organization is finally teaching us about racism. I have been waiting for them to do that. Mm -mm, mm -mm. This statement was a fish out of water moment for me in which I could see a cross racial dynamic I hadn't seen before. I had witnessed the tremendous amount of emotional and intellectual work Carolyn had to do in order to make this presentation. Now, Watching this group sitting comfortably on their chairs and effortlessly receiving the result of Carolyn's labor, I saw a metaphor for colonialism. The group was in essence saying, we'll observe you and seek to understand you. In doing so, we'll relax while you work. You'll provide us with the fruits of your labor. We'll receive these fruits and consider them. We'll decide what to keep and what to reject what we deem worthy of consideration and what we don't. We thank the organization for bringing you to us because we've desired your knowledge. But if you weren't brought before us, we wouldn't, as we haven't up until now, expend any effort in seeking it for ourselves. Critical race scholar Shireen Razek, writing about whiteness and a pattern of studying those who are seen as different, quote unquote, describes this mentality as the, quote, cornerstone of imperialism. The colonized possess a series of knowable characteristics that can be studied, known, and managed accordingly by the colonizers whose own complici complicity remains mask, unquote. Further, this group member position not having this knowledge previously as a shortcoming of the organization rather than of himself so that he also managed to elevate his own moral standing still his credit went to the organization not to carolyn while i assume that none of this was his conscious intention it was the impact of his comment and what role did I play in all of this? While I could clearly see the racial dynamics in the group's behavior, I didn't ask myself at the time what aspects of these dynamics I was in collusion with. Looking back, I realized that while it was exhausting for Carolyn, I found it to be an interesting quote unquote learning experience. One in which I was the quote unquote good white person there as an ally for my black friend. I came away from that incident feeling proud of myself and how I had supported Carolyn and equipped with new insights on how other white people's racism worked. I understand that Carolyn asked me to support her in that particular way and to decline was not an option I would have considered, but that does not put me outside the racism she was preparing for and as i write this i realize that i never checked myself and my own racial arrogance in that situation what might it have looked like if i had i could i could have challenged the judgment i felt as i watched the group interact with carolyn i could have shared my insight on the colonialist dynamic i observed in the group the very people who were there to further their understanding of racism. I could have checked in with Carolyn and actually asked if she felt supported by me, but I did not do any of those things. Instead, on our ride home, I assumed for myself that she felt supported instead of asking. 
I proceeded to point out everything I noticed about that white, about what the white people in the group were doing. This had the effect of both reinforcing the racism for Carolyn, in case she had missed any nuance of it that I noticed, while positioning me as a, quote, smartest white person in the room, unquote, the white person who, quote, got it, unquote. I didn't give her much room to express any pain or disappointment she may have felt about aspects of my own complicity. Wow, that is deep. So, um, well-meaning white people, I feel that they could ask and check in with us. Um, You know, did we feel supported? Because sometimes we don't. I had this colleague. (laughs) Oh, she um, always wanted me to let her know if she was doing something inappropriate, inappropriately racial. And when I told her, she jumped down my throat. So it's interesting um, how people have blind spots. Okay. Our identities are not separate from the white supremacist society in which we are raised, and our patterns of cross-racial engagement are not merely a function of our unique personalities. Good intentions, so-called open-mindedness, belief in racial justice, and identifying as a racially progressive are not sufficient. I'm glad uh, the author recognizes that. Whenever we may be on the continuum of seeing and addressing racism, we are not at the end. As white progressives who have spent years engaged in anti-racist work, as a white progressive who has spent years engaged in anti-racist work, I have developed self-awareness, skills, and relationships I would never have had if I had not simply followed the path laid out before me by mainstream society. At the same time, I continue to struggle with stubborn and deeply internalized racist patterns. Oof, I'm glad she knows this about herself. And it does take a certain amount of uh, self-awareness and skills to be able to realize that her racism is internalized. My work... She goes on to say, uh, the author goes on to say, My work is meant to share my learning as well as my failures with other white people so that we might do less racial harm. To that end, I say we, quote unquote, our, quote unquote, and us, quote unquote. I am referring to, so to that end, when I say we, our, and us, I am referring to white people. I understand that race is a social construct whose borders and boundaries shift over time. The category white is not perfectly discreet, however. Uh, However, for the purposes of this analysis, I use the term white, quote unquote, to refer to people who are defined and perceived to be white by their societies at large and in most contexts. In chapter one, I'll explain which white people I mean specifically by the qualifier progressive, quote-unquote progressive. As a white person who writes about race specifically to my fellow white people, I am not seeking to teach white people about black people. I am seeking to teach white people about ourselves in relation to black people and other people of color. Black people, indigenous peoples, and people of color may find an insider analysis useful in navigating white social and institutional control and in challenging the gaslighting they so often encounter when trying to talk to us about racism. Uh, Yes, gaslighting is prevalent, okay? Uh, The author goes on to say, I am often asked why white people should listen to a white person on racism. For me, the shift to focusing my work on teaching white people about racism was made when I became aware of the profound injustices of white supremacy and my role in them. Yes. (laughs) Thank you for acknowledging your role in white supremacy. I made a commitment 
personally and professionally to the educational aspect of anti-racism practice. Now, drawing from years of experience, I apply my particular skills as an educator to this commitment. I write books and articles specifically as a white person to white people. My goal is to help us get out of denial. Whew. Help us get out of denial about our racism and be less harmful to black people and other people of color. If I didn't think that was possible, I couldn't continue. We are capable of doing better. Yes, uh, my snaps is like, yes, yes, yes. Let me be clear. I have been mentored by and learned greatly from the work of BIPOC people. I am not claiming and would not claim that we should only listen to white people or engage in isolation. I do not believe that white people can think critically about racism, our role in it, and how we can challenge it if we are not in relationship with and if we do not listen to black people and other people of color. I cannot articulate the dynamics of white fragility without that guidance, including the years of reading the work of black writers who came before my time. Particularly influential were W.E.B. Du Bois, Audre Lorde, James Baldwin, and Derrick Bell. I have engaged with the work of BIPOC people in the present, including that of sociologist Patricia Hill Collins, and Eduardo Bonilla Silva, philosopher Charles W. Mills, writers Toni Morrison and Bell Hooks, psychologist Beverly Daniel Tatum, and ethnic study professors Linda Tuhuai Smith, Tracy Lay, Leticia Nayero, Stacy J. Lee, Shireen Razak, and Thandika, among many others. And I apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name. On a personal level, black women in particular have been invaluable mentors to me, including Deborah Terry, Darlene Flynn, Anika Naila, Victoria Santos, Cheryl Harris, and Erin Trent Johnson. At the same time, as an insider to whiteness, I have valuable perspective to offer that BIPOC people don't have and one that is different from and can support that of black educators. I do not believe that white people can fully understand racism and our role in it if we only listen to BIPOC people. We have much of our own personal and collective work to do, and it should not and cannot be the responsibility of people of color to get us to do it. Okay, I'm going to say that again because, and I'm not going to snap because I love this. I love the accountability. We have much of our own personal and collective work to do, and it should not and cannot be the responsibility of people of color to get us to do it. Indeed, I don't think there will be structural transformation without personal transformation. In this sense, personal transformation is an act of anti-racism. I love it. Yes, personal transformation, um, that in and of itself, changing your perspective, changing how you deal with people of color, that is an uh, act of anti-racism. White people must understand how race shapes our lives, our own lives, and how we are conditioned into complicity regardless of awareness or, inti or intention. If you can understand that you're conditioned, you will look for the patterns. Whereas if you don't think you haven't been conditioned, then most likely you'll be defensive. Uh, white people also need to know, white people also need an insider perspective from someone who has quote unquote been there and had that thought, felt that emotion, and acted that behavior, struggled with feedback, and had that insight that we can relate to and that can serve as an example. It is also harder to deny a shared experience. Insiders can expose and uniquely challenge us in ways invaluable to our, our growth. I have also needed mentorship from white activists and scholars. Ruth Frankenberg's work in particular has been deeply impactful as has that of Michelle Fine, David Rodinger, 
Tom, excuse me, Tim Wise, Lillian Smith, Peggy McIntosh, Twin A, Van Dijk, Dyke, and Joe Fagan. Uh, it's Van D I J K. It looks either Swedish or um, Dutch, and I don't have a good grasp of how to speak or pronounce uh, Dutch words. Finally, I've had to apply what I have learned by integrating the range of work that has shaped my thinking with ongoing personal self-reflection. Yes, study, yes, research, struggle, mistake making, yes, 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 cross-racial relationship building, risk-taking, feedback, synthesis, and talking to thousands of people about racism. Yes, 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 yes. I have not come to my current understanding easily in a single moment following a single event or by jumping over much hard personal and cross racial work. I have been studying, speaking out, co-leading and writing on whiteness since 1995. My dissertation 2004 was titled Whiteness and Racial Dialogue, a Discourse Analysis, in which I tracked how white students deflected feedback on racism during a cross-racial dialogue. Following receipt of my PhD, I went into academic teaching. In 2011, a decade ago, I wrote the article, Ripe Fragility. I was not paid to write it and received no royalties from it. Further, it was published in an open source journal, which means that the article is free and accessible to anyone. Non-open source journals charge high fees for people outside academia to access the articles. A few years later, around 2014, someone quoted from the article on social media and it went viral. I began to receive messages of gratitude and feedback on the value of the article from which people worldwide both BIPOC people and white. The article was so helpful to so many that I decided to turn it into a fuller book and to go through a non-academic publisher so that it would be more accessible in language and cost. Beacon Press is a non-profit social justice oriented publisher. For more details on my financial accountability, see my website. So I don't know if this happened. I'm guessing people had said, oh, you're profiting off of uh, racism. And so she, I think she's just setting the record clear. I don't know. I don't have the history or the background on that. But uh, she is being financially accountable. And I haven't looked at the details of it. And frankly, I don't care. I just like that she has um, written this book. She also wrote Light Fragility, of course. I did listen to it, as I mentioned, in one of my earlier videos. And um, I, I love her as an ally. Um, whew. I don't remember when it was, but it's been a few years, if not a decade, uh, that I read Post Traumatic Stress Syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGru. And I hope I pronounced her name correctly. Uh, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome is a book that every black person should read. It would, it's, uh, it makes you feel validated about some of the stuff that is going on in society because we have been gaslit so much in uh, recent times and all of our lives since before slavery. Um, so nice racism also I feel is going to be validating because white fragility was as well. And I'll put uh, post-traumatic slave syndrome in the description so that you can have a link to the book. Uh, going back to what the author writes, we need many points into fighting racism. We need many entry points into fighting racism. And mine is to use my learning over decades as a white anti-racism scholar and educator in order to contribute to a more racially just society, one in which white people might cause less black must less pain for black people and other people of color. 
This is the particular contribution I bring to the table of anti-racism work. I understand that there are those who do not think white people should be at the table at all in any public way, but for the reasons already stated, I believe we play a necessary part in building multiracial coalitions. This is not a zero-sum game wherein we can only read one book, and if that book is written by a white person, we have closed ourselves to books by black authors. My work is meant to be read in conjunction with and help open readers to a wider world of BIPOC, anti-racist thought that so many have been closed off to. If white people were already open to the perspectives of BIPOC peoples, we would be in a different place. Many people have strong opinions on how racism should be challenged. Even those who are white and living segregated lives and newly introduced to the concepts. But if you have not tried to educate white students, employees, and community members over weeks, months, or even years, you cannot know what it takes to get them to acknowledge the reality of systemic racism. While educating white people on racism and getting them to change attitudes and behaviors is rarely easy, the nature of implicit bias is that white people are more likely to be open to initial challenges to our racial, prop racial positions, perspectives, and behaviors from a fellow white person. My books are only a few of the numerous books on the topic, and white people can and should read many books on racism, especially those written by black people and other people of color, but far too long because white people tend to see race as not our problem, we have offloaded loaded the work of anti-racism onto BIPOC people and exempted ourselves from the conversation. In this way, we protect and uphold white supremacy while falsely maintaining racial innocence. I am offering one of many approaches to this issue. One I believe is important and too often has been missing from the conversation. I am well aware that I am inside a system I am seeking to challenge and that my work both upholds and hopefully interrupts this system. Writer and activist Audre Lorde wrote, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. She was critiquing feminists of the 1970s and 80s who claimed to represent all women, all women, but who focused their concerns on white middle class women. Lord's quote speaks to the dilemma of challenging the system from within. This is one of the major obstacles I face as a right, white person writing about race. My aim is to use my platform to break with white solidarity Discenter whiteness by exposing its workings, interrupt white denial of racism, and motivate white people to act more toward a more racially just society. In large part, whiteness stays centered by being unnamed, the unspoken default against which otherness, quote unquote, is measured. To Decenter whiteness, you must name and expose it, and there is a very specific and there is a very specific way that white people can do that. Never the only way, but a key and all too often missing one. At the same time, the master's tools dilemma recognizes that whiteness is simultaneously being reinforced when white voices are centered and quote-unquote easier to hear. As a white person focusing on white people, I struggle with this both and tension but have come to terms with it. Overall, as none of us is or can be outside the system. Uh, let's see. I got a text. Sorry, got distracted. 
One way I work to reconcile the tension is to be quote unquote less white. By that, I don't mean I want to reclaim my ethnic roots and be more Italian American. For me to be less white, quote unquote, is to counter my socialization into whiteness, to be less racially oppressive, less racially ignorant, and less arrogant in my ignorance, less defensive and silent and complicit. Racism perverts and distorts reality and thus white people are generally granted more objectivity and legitimacy when speaking about racism in spite of our lack of neutrality. To be less white is to use that entry point and work with other white people to interrupt racism. It is unacceptable for me not to use the credibility and access granted by whiteness to challenge racism. I have received and incorporated feedback from many colleagues, mentors, workshop participants, and anti-racist educators over many years. Now, as a very visible white public figure writing and speaking openly and directly about racism, I am overwhelmed with feedback from every side and that feedback is often contradictory. I cannot and will not get it right by everyone and I am necessarily limited in full understanding by my racial position. However, I do believe I am in my integrity with black people and other people of color and with racially conscious white people who have continued to mentor me over many years and with whom I am in close accountability relationships. Yes, I like these close accountability relationships. Find someone who you can be accountable to um, when it comes to racism and when it just comes to your personal development. I hope and recommend that all white people develop similar deep and broad cross racial networks of support and accountability for lifelong learning so we show up as effective partners and engage constructively in anti-racist efforts. Then she goes on to say a note on language. And I guess I could read that. Language is not neutral. The terms and phrases we use do not simply describe what we observe. In large part, the terms and phrases we use shape how we perceive or make meaning of what we observe. This is why the terms used for marginalized groups are constantly being challenged and negotiated. Consider the difference between quote unquote illegal alien and quote a person entering the country illegally, illegally unquote. Uh, yeah, a person entering the country illegally sounds much better than an, Ill an illegal alien. Or the difference between China virus quote unquote and COVID-19, quote-unquote, or the trajectory of changes over my lifetime of this set of terms. So a bum, tramp, wino, hobo, vagrant, homeless, persons without housing, and those are all in quotes. Uh, even gypsy has been, we have, instead of saying gypsy, we might refer to a, as a traditionally called, so-called, gypsy as a Romanian or we might um, say what where they are from instead of using the term gypsy. There are significant differences between the images and associations at the start of that list and the end. Those differences impact our perceptions and have real consequences for how people are treated and the resources they receive. So are you going to help an illegal alien or would you prefer to help a person entering the country illegally? And with that, are you willing, more willing to help someone who is wanting to better their lives and is a hard worker versus a person entering the country illegally? Language is political and thus a continual state of struggle over who is deemed worthy of respect and access. Terms can implicitly authorize and normalize forms of domination and control or interrupt them. That is so true. 
racial terms in particular are in flux and historic power relations are made visible to mainstream to the mainstream and awareness of structural inequality inequity excuse me is deepened as I write this, systemic racism is being directly named and challenged in unprecedented ways, and people will have different levels of understanding, given the political, contextual, and changing nature of language. None of the language I use will likely be acceptable at all times to all readers. No terms are perfect, and when speaking of racialized people, they all collapse diverse cultures into one. For example, Asian people are the majority of the planet and comprise 48 different countries and cultures. Still, most people in the, Uni in the United States don't differentiate between these cultures. Wow. For the purpose of this limited analysis, I will address racial dynamics at the macro level in general terms. So going back to Asian cultures... Um, don't call an Asian person Oriental. That is not the correct term. Oriental refers to items, not the person, okay? When I am speaking specifically about a racialized group of people, I will use the current most recognizable term for that group. For example, Asian, Latinx, Indigenous, and Black. Sometimes I'll use African American. My choice here will be based on what is being used in a context I am describing, what flows with what I am writing, or what is used by a person I am quoting. When I am speaking about people more broadly, I will sometimes use the term people of color, and sometimes use the term racialized to make the point that while we all have an assigned race, mainstream culture consistently marks the race only for those who are not white. Interesting, I never noticed that. The term indicates that this is a verb or active process, not a noun or an inherent or biological state of being. Sometimes I will spell out my name, spell out the name of each group, but most often will use the acronyms BIPOC. It stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Black and Indigenous are highlighted to acknowledge the unique historical relationship these two groups have to the establishment of white supremacy and that they historically and currently face the harshest degrees of racism. The acronym is the most current usage that I am aware of but not necessarily recognized fully in the mainstream. Further, there is no consensus among people of color about the term. Some appreciate that it is more inclusive, others see it as eraser. Sandra Garcia, explaining the acronym in a New York Times piece, noted the term has caused confusion and there isn't universal agreement about what it means or whom it actually includes, but to most people, the people of color includes Latinos and Asians. I recognize that the term still collapses a large number of diverse racial groups into pop, people of color. I will add peoples to the end. While that doesn't quite work grammatically, it feels more humanizing to me. Whether to capitalize the terms black and white, quote unquote, also is also an unsettled political issue. On the one hand, capitalizing black but not the white interrupts the historical evaluation of white above blacks. On the other hand, not capitalizing white minimizes its power as a racial category and reinforces white as the default. In explaining the Associated Press requirement of capitalizing black but not white, John Daninsky, the AP's vice president for standards, wrote, we agree that white people's skin plays into systemic inequalities and injustices, and we want our journalism to robustly explore these problems. But capitalizing the term white, quote-unquote, as done by white supremacists, risks subtly, excuse me, risks subtly conveying legitimacy to such beliefs. So he wrote, we agree that white people's skin color plays into systemic inequalities and injustices, 
and we want our journalism to robustly explore these problems, but capitalizing the term white, quote unquote, as done by white supremacists, risks subtly conveying legitimacy to such beliefs. The Columbia Journalism Review, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, USA Today, The Los Angeles Times, NBC News, and the Chicago Tri Tribune are among the organizations that have recently stated that they will capitalize black, quote unquote, but not white. White doesn't represent a shared culture and history in the way black does, quote unquote, that whole sentence. The New York Times explained, while I argue here that white, quote unquote, does represent a shared history and culture in a racialized sense, I follow these norms and capitalize black, but not white. Black, quote unquote, not white, quote unquote. I will also be using the term, quote, white supremacy, unquote, which elicits a strong reaction from many white people. In popular culture, white supremacy, quote unquote, connotes people who would wear hoods and explicitly espouse the ideolo ideology, ideology that white people are superior. But this usage is extremely narrow and simplistic and leaves out vast layers of nuance and complexity. I use the broader sociological understanding of the term, which includes the multitude of ways our society elevates white people as the human ideal and norm for humanity and relegates everyone else as a particular kind of human and always a lesser deviation from the white ideal. This regulation is reinforced when we consistently mark the race of anyone who is not white while not naming our own. I use the terms racism and white supremacy, both quoted somewhat interchangeably, but racism can be thought of a systemic outcome of white supremacist ideology. Throughout this book, I will discuss racism in binary terms, white people and people of color, white people and racialized people, white people and BIPOC people. For the purposes of challenging many problematic dynamics of racism, such as individualism and colorblindness, it is important for those of us who are white to suspend our focus on ourselves as unique and or outside of race and focus instead on our collective racial experience. Discussing white people in general terms may be seen as an interruption of the normal dynamics of racism. However, for people of color, being seen as unique individuals outside of race is not a privilege that can be taken for granted. So while talking about race and racism in general terms may be constructive for white people, it collapses many diverse racial groups into one big category. In so doing, the particular ways that different racial groups experience racism in the larger society are obscured. These differences include specific histories and cultures, how people within a group have learned to adapt to racism in order to survive, how they are represented in larger society, the role the group has been set up to play in relation to whiteness, how comfortable white people are with the group, the groups perceive adjacency to whiteness, and so on. For example, the experience of a person whose family has been in the U.S. for many generations will be different than a will be different than a first or second generation immigrant. That's true. That is so true. Um, it's interesting how people will say go back to Mexico when this whole country is full of immigrants. Some people of color have been adopted and raised by white families, and these families often take a colorblind, quote-unquote, approach to raising cross-racially adopted children. These children will have a different experience and a sense of identity than those who are raised in families who share race. Anti-racist practice involves ongoing education on these complexities, as well as flexibility excuse me, as well as flexibility and skill in navigating the many facets and nuances of the racial construct. Unfortunately, those histories and differences are beyond the scope of this book. I encourage my readers to continually educate themselves in these differences 
well beyond this text. I apologize in advance for the minimization of a broad range of experiences. When I envision the racial construct upholding white supremacy, I see two anchors fixing it in place. One anchor is white and the other is black. As I wrote in White Fragility, I believe that anti-blackness is the root of white supremacy. White is not possible without black. Superior is not possible without inferior. As historian Michael Foucault posits, power is a relation, not a possession. I'm just letting this all sink in. You cannot have white without black. Racial trauma therapist Resma Menachem powerfully writes, The white body is the supreme standard by which all bodies' humanity shall be measured. If the white body is the standard of humanity, then it stands that the black body is inhuman and the antithesis and to this is and to this is and this it is oh my gosh i'm having a problem with that word um the white body is the supreme standard by which all bodies humanity shall be measured if the white body is the standard of humanity then it stands that the black body is inhuman and that the antithesis of humanity Every hue further away from that standard is deemed less human. Quote unquote. In the white mind, black people are the ultimate racial other, quote unquote, or antithesis of white. Again, this does not mean that other racialized people don't experience racism or that the dynamics I describe here don't apply, but the dynamics I'm describing are made most visible when we view them through the relations between black and white people. Therefore, many, many of the examples I use will be based on these interactions. Like race, gender is a social construct. And essentialist notions of male and female have also been deeply challenged. I am a cisgender woman, which means my gender assignment at birth, my internal gender identity and my expression of that of my identity are the same. My gender pronouns are she and her, quote unquote. When I use the terms man or woman, quote unquote, I am referring to people's primary identities. If someone identifies as a female or woman, as a male or as a man, they are included in the terms. I also recognize that there are non-binary readers who do not identify with either character category or not with either one consistently when I do not need to specify programs excuse me when I do not need to specify pronouns I will use they and theirs quote unquote for purposes of brevity and flow I will not be adding a third term I apologize to those who are marginalized by that omission um, I like that she offers apologies to people who are marginalized and minimized. I feel like she's being accountable. Because she said that, where does she say that? She said it when she was talking about um, different colors and being raised in families with different colors and um, not having a whole bunch of experiences. She said, I apologize in advance for the minimization of a broad range of experiences because I know that she said she didn't have enough context for that. So I like that she's being accountable. This book is a follow-up to white fragility. I do not set out to establish that systemic racism and white supremacy exist, as I did in that book, nor do I set out to establish that all white people receive, absorb, and are influenced by the racist messages continuously circulating across the society we live in. 
Rather, I proceed from these premises and assume that my readers do too. In white fragility, I made a claim that white progressive caused the most daily harm to black, indigenous, and other racialized people. Here, I will explain some of the specific ways we do so. Because many of these ways may be less obvious, they are also more insidious. So that was the introduction. I can't wait to get into this book. Um, so <laughs> uh, as a black woman in America, I have experienced what I would deem as nice racism. So um, I have a feeling this book will be validating for my experiences. And it is exhausting being gaslit and having to explain and defend. So I look forward to reading this book. If you have any questions or comments, please write them in the comments. And I hope you're having a wonderful day or evening wherever you're at in the world. Bye.